Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corlick from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Outcast. I am your host, Adam Corlick, and this is the September 2024 episode, which is also a very special episode because, as it happens, this is the 100th episode of this podcast. Yay! Um, so, but we'll talk all, we got some special things lined up here before, you know, before you guys, but before we do that, I just want to say, remind you, of course, that this is a Patreon backed podcast. So, and I appreciate your support and I will put links in the description if you want to get early access to this, or if you want to, um, you know, just support the channel in general, pick subjects, get shout outs, or even be on the podcast. Uh, and there have been many people over the course of this podcast it's 100 episodes who have been on here some that were very just temporary one-off type of things where you know someone like shout out to gary rock solid gaming uh who once just did one episode of the show uh and then we've had over time a lot of various patreon backers who have taken the time to appear on the show and so on and so forth and we have some of them lined up today all right stay tuned for that but for now we're going to start with the uh the og the best the most amazing Joseph Tamburino. Welcome back. Glad to be back, Adam. And wow, it's 100 episodes. I know, right? <laughs> it's See, the thing is go. Yeah, I let's do, tell me about it. I mean, so we'll we'll get to this, but like, you know, the at the time we're recording this, the uh Dreamcast just turned 25 in North America, the PS1 just turned 29. The Neo Geo CD just turned 30, and I think not too long ago, the DS just turned, like, 20. So it's like, ugh. <laughs> mm. Time flies. Now, the thing with the 100 episodes of this podcast that's kind of cool is that it's not weekly. So th this is 100 months. Months yeah, I've worth been of content. on this show for over two years now. Exactly. And so I appreciate you sticking around. And obviously, everybody out there very much appreciate you who stick around. I know it was never the most watched thing on this channel. I get that. Real shame, too, because I think a lot of our best content is in this. Uh, if you just want a casual discussion and just hear what's going on and get the, the, the news from our take, if you will, as well as just other waxing inane thoughts that we have. I always appreciate that the the, the people who do actually listen to this that you have stuck around and you continue to do that. I appreciate you guys. I really do. So before we get to any sort of cameos and all that sort of fun stuff, we're going to start off with uh, the conventional way this typically goes. So Joseph, obviously as a backer, you get to pick a subject. Uh, did, what did you want to go with? Something that maybe happened today. <laughs> well, originally, like I was just thinking we were just going to talk about like Sony's massive mistake. Uh, with Concord and how that game died within two weeks and to the point where Sony decided to just refund everybody instead of like trying to make it free to play or whatever. But then Sony had to go and, you know, announce the PS5 Pro this morning and the fact that it's going to be 700 US dollars. I'm already breaking out into laughter again like I did like when I first saw that. It truly, like, yeah, it's truly baffling, <laughs> dude. Like... I can't believe they thought that that, or, or, or we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's, let's start with Concord. Okay. Let's just start with Concord. So, um, I think you said it best when you pitched the idea to me, it's fair to say that neither of us are going to have great detail on a game. Neither of us could have possibly played. That's fair. Mm -hmm. So obviously we can't speak to it from that perspective, but I will speak to it from the perspective of like what actually happened. So here is the basic elevator understanding I have of what went down with Concord. That game was in development for eight years and it was clearly met, It was created in the mold of uh, Overwatch, right? That's, Sony just kind of saw, like, I mean, that was the big thing that was going on at the time. The idea that you could make this kind of online shooter type of game that's just kind of chaos and, you know, whatever. I mean, obviously, there's better terms for that particular type of game style. But that that mentality of that, make a game like that, and you can just constantly resell it over and over, and it just stays online. People pay for, you know, um, you know DLC and all, all that sort of stuff. But loot you said boxes. It, like, yes. Overwatch is where loot... Well, it's not where loot boxes came from, but it's where they came into like paid video games. 
You are 100% correct about that. And you know, we're, we're obviously just kind of jumping ahead to it, but like the one of the biggest mistakes they made was thinking that you know, they could also charge you $40 on, on the base of that rather than make it free to play. That was just one of many. To be fair, Overwatch also charged. Didn't it drop it? Play. I mean, maybe eventually. I never really gave much yeah, crap it, about Overwatch. No, no, I'm with you on that. I could, I could swear they did, but I mean, that was eight years ago. Um, but the point is that, that Sony got into it on that, and they spent $100 million on the budget of that game. A hundred. I'm surprised it's that low for eight years, honestly. Yeah, I mean, but you know, like that's an obscene amount of money. I feel bad for the actual developers because you can tell that they were just kind of told that they had to make a game like this. There was probably a lot of talent and effort in there, but not really any necessary creative drive to make something different or interesting. The game was basically built to be a product. You know, I was watching a lot mm -hmm. of gameplay of it this morning, or at least some, you know, videos with consisting of a lot of gameplay. And it basically came off like I won't name names, but they were back in the day. I used to go to more of these like press event type of things, and there were games very similar to this from certain companies that just felt very uninspired. And you're just like, somebody just said, we need to make a game like this other big popular game, and we're going to throw the kitchen sink at it to try and make it work. And in in Concord's case, we might have just seen the single biggest modern day failure of a video game. Like, I was looking at some numbers, right? The game was only operable for 11 days. 11 days. Yeah, yeah it sounds about as, right. As far as its actual release, there was pre-release stuff, people who got in on alpha and all that. The numbers for that kind of thing were released. I think the alpha kind of topped out at like 2,700 players, which is really low. And then when the game actually came out, it topped out at about 700 people playing it on day one. And that's really Jeez. bad. Yeah, really bad. I mean, are those just Steam numbers or are those like even the that's, PS that's, PlayStation that's, numbers? That's all numbers. In fact, it gets worse oh, than that. Oh, yeah, ow. It, it gets worse than that. Um, it it only sold uh, twenty five thousand copies, ten thousand of which were Steam sales specifically, all of which were refunded. <laughs> by the way, um, I mean all of the sales were refunded, but with one exception, which was there is a physical edition PS five version of that game. Uh, which is useless. It doesn't do anything. Uh, and, however, uh, one thing to point out is I, it, from what I read, and I, this is unverified, but from what I read that a lot of those numbers of the, the sales they got also included all the review keys they gave away, which included also the people that uh, actually put, you know, uh, that were actually representative of that 2,700 in pre-alpha and all that, and then the 700 that were actually playing it. In other words, the number of people that actually paid to play this game was maybe a few hundred people for a hundred million dollar release made over the course of eight years. God. And I know. And so that's that's what I find fascinating about this, because I, I was oh, watching. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's insane. It, it's worse than I thought. It's much like, worse. Yeah. So I'm watching footage of it. Right. And I'm thinking, like, why did this happen? And as I then I figured it out in, like, the recesses of my brain, as I'm watching footage of the game be played, I forgot what I was watching. Not due to dementia. Yes, I'm old. But like I what I was saying is that the game looked nothing about it stuck out as interesting or iconic or different. It was just like random hodgepodge of miscellaneous characters that don't really say anything as far as the the presentation they have. Like if you design a character, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's not just about writing a character. When it comes to the aesthetics, the character, particularly in something like a movie or a video game or a TV show, especially in something animated like this, the character has to be presented in such a way that their physique tells you a little bit, if not all, of the story about that character. So, like, for example, if you can... I know this is dumb, but if you can envision in your head... Uh, like the Hamburglar from McDonald's, you know, what uh, What does that tell you just by looking at him? 
Right. I, I, I he, see what you're getting at. He he looks like a criminal. You know, or if you if you look, he looks at, like you, a criminal who really loves to eat hamburgers. Exactly. It, it tells you. I mean, granted, his name helps you with that one too. Well, but it, yes, but I mean, but, like it, but, you look at him and you're like, okay, this isn't a very skinny dude. Like I I can see him why he's going after burgers. Yeah, and like literally, he's dressed like a criminal. Like he's got like mm-hmm. the the bandana that looks like he's you know like a raccoon or something. He's trying to steal things, but whatever. My point is th- they. You illustrate a character to look like that. This, to me, looked like somebody said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did a legally safe version of Guardians of the Galaxy and made it play like Overwatch? You know, it just it didn't look like and then nothing about it really captivated my interests. And like I said, I'm watching the game. It's like, okay, fine. Take away the aesthetics. This isn't a story-based game. Fine. Let's just look at the gameplay of it. And to me, it just looked like the same thing I've seen a hundred times. You know, stuff that like I used to play in some of these media events going back eight years ago. And I just did not... I didn't resonate with it. And to be honest, if I had ever seen footage of it at some state of play or some sort of E3 thing or whatever, I legitimately don't remember because it made no impression whatsoever. And I, I do th- actually remember that. Oh, do tell, do tell. Re- reveal about it. Like, I remember like watching it and like, okay, um, so this definitely looks like discount Guardians of the Galaxy, but what's, what exactly is, what exactly, where exactly are they going to go with, oh, this is an Overwatch. Like, once it actually started showing the gameplay, I was like, oh, it's an Overwatch. And any potential interest I would have had in Concord immediately evacuated. Not that there was much, I was just more confused, like, trying to figure out exactly, like, okay, so they're doing the whole Marvel banter, popcorn y movie type deal, but where are they going with this? And then the answer was, nowhere, it's just a, it's an arena shooter, and whatever. Yeah, that's my point. I, again, it, it it actually does seem like someone sat down and said, let's just combine those two things in the most surface way possible. I'm sure it'll just be popular because it will just be popular. Because it, it's just an overall bad image. I genuinely feel terrible for the developers because, I mean, to them it was a job. Mm-hmm. And it will always be this thing that's kind of attached to them. In fact, I would bet that development studio is just done. Um Probably, yeah. Yeah, I, I can't imagine they survive it. You know, there was a hundred million dollars that went into this, and I, I'm like, that was Sony's hundred million dollars that went in, no doubt, to pay the development team and all that stuff. So those people got paid. It's not like the you know the the money just evaporates into nothing. People got paid, but like, man, what a, a colossal financial disaster. Because if you if you think about it, dude, they spent a hundred million dollars, and the it at best sold a couple hundred copies within like the first week because even yeah. the numbers we do have the 25,000 we've got includes both uh it includes steam and includes steam we know was 10,000 so that accounts for 15,000 across epic ps uh playstation 5 digital and playstation 5 physical we don't i don't personally i don't have those numbers but we also know the vast majority of people that played it, at least across um, Steam and Epic, did return it. I don't know how that works on PlayStation, to be honest with you. Um, uh, now, I do know that Sony has specifically said that if you have a physical copy, go get in touch with your retailer to get a refund. No, no I, I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, as a general policy, forget the unique circumstances of this game. I don't know if you can return stuff digitally with Sony in like a 24-hour period or something like that. Oh, I know I know there's usually exceptions. Yeah, like, see, I, I don't, I don't know that. I know, I just know that because I see it in the comments section all the time with Steam and Epic that that's more of a thing. But a- anyway, the point is, a, a good majority of these people actually did without the cancellation do this. Return anyway. it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that leaves an interesting situation where you could be looking at a hundred million dollar game where maybe at best, like a thousand people actually bought it and kept it. And that's, that is probably the single, like, let's assume that's a correct number. I know I'm, we're kind of pulling out of our ass, right? But let's Mm -hmm. take a hundred million dollars. Okay. Divided by, you know, what, uh, $60 a, 
actually, what am I trying to say here? Uh, if we take a uh, hundred copies, let's say it's a hundred copies, and each one retails at what, like sixty bucks? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, no, Concord was forty, but Concord was forty. Okay, well, let's do it right then. Four thousand dollars from a hundred million dollar budget. Uh, yeah, at, with at that level of interest, yeah, it really makes sense why they didn't bother like trying to make it free to play because it's just at this point it's just like they'll lose more money trying to do that and it, than just refunding whoever's left. Like, here's the thing: even if the the twenty five thousand copies we know did sell, uh, and even if they all sold and they kept that money at forty dollars a piece, that's one million dollars exactly. Even in that scenario, which is not what happened, they lost ninety nine million dollars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like even in that scenario, and that's their best case. So they effectively refund that. That is just straight up a loss. Like this will, this game will be forgotten, obviously, but yeah. it won't be forgotten because of the gameplay itself. You know, this isn't a bad game that came out and kind of fell flat. It had its, like, you know, short time, and the servers went down after a year, and it just underperformed. Like, uh, what was that one that 2K did? Um, Battleborn? That yeah, sounds Battleborn. familiar. That, that sounds yeah. like a thing that existed, yeah. Yeah, it was similar to Overwatch Battleborn. You know, that one actually, it didn't, it did poorly. But it was out for a while. People played it. Now we just, if anybody remembers it, they just kind of like, oh yeah, that, yeah. This Mm -hmm. will likely go down and infamy territory. Uh, It's like the water world of the video game industry. You know what I mean? And water world isn't, and that's a film, didn't fail this spectacularly. Uh, You know, we'll, we'll have to see what other additional information comes of this, but man, the, the ripple effect that's going to come from this is insane. And actually, I think that's a good way of leading into the second part of this, which is the PS5 Pro mm-hmm. debacle today. So let's get, the, yeah. let's get that out there, shall we? Um, so I posted a tweet about this after it happened. Uh, I, I just tried to succinctly summarize what had occurred. And I'll read it to you exactly. The PS5 Pro costs $700 USD before tax and doesn't come with a disk drive. It's compatible with the separately sold disk drive for $80. $780 before tax, you get a mid-generation upgrade. No thanks. This is heartbreaking for physical media. Also, the stand isn't included. You know, that plastic stand that is apparently required so the thing doesn't fall over or overheat? That's an additional $30. Just FYI. Wait, is that is that needed for the Pro and Slim, or is that just the original model that needed that? Uh, apparently, the Slim needs. I don't own a Slim, but somebody was telling me it's uh, more or less essential to actually make it. <laughs> I'm just oh. like, uh, I, somebody, I don't. What the I, fuck are you doing? They're doing everything wrong, is what they're doing. It, it, um, yeah, like, what did they look at all of Microsoft's mess ups this past year and be like, "Well, looky here, we could we could make two big colossal mistakes." And we'll probably still be ahead. Is that is that their thought? Pro- well, obviously that's a joke, but like it, it really feels like that they they saw Microsoft's mistakes and be like, "Well, we could make a ton of mistakes and still be perfectly fine." So let's go do it. Hold my beer, logic, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so this, I mean, I'm not going to call this the PS6 because it's not. But it do, if you want to go by historical trends, this this repeats the always present curse of the third console. You know, what happens with the third console always is the same thing. Like, in case of Sony, specifically, PS1, first console out the gate, does really well. They improve on it. They do insane with the PS2. Literally the most successful console ever made. They had every reason to believe that no matter what they did, they would succeed. That's where they made all the mistakes with the PlayStation 3. They had to eat a bunch of humble pie. And then on PS4, they did everything smart because they had to. They had to make money on that system. And then after they did well with that, PS5 was there like, okay, we're, we're coming back. We're going to make some moves. We're going to change this up. Right? You, you know, get back in good graces. And it did well to the point where I remember a few years ago, yeah, pandemic and shortages aside, the PS5, no matter, despite the fact that it still is known as like a system that really doesn't have that many worthwhile games on it, 
is still something people want and people were selling like crazy. So the PS5 Pro in a in a way it almost resembles this concept of like this would be their PS6 where they come out and say no matter what you well, what we do you'll buy it. A technically I mean, technically I mean if you're just counting by pure by the pure numbers that would have been the PS5. Oh, I know, so I know. They're because overdue, you're, but <laughs> I know. If we're talking, the thing is, I don't include the Vita or the PSP in that, and I don't include the. Other I was stuff, talking about the, the PS4 Pro, but well, yeah, there's the PS4 Pro. There's also other slim models. I, I know, I know, and yeah. that, that's why I'm saying this is an imperfect example. But it almost feels like this is what would be a PS6 announcement that we were all upset about. But what mm-hmm. makes it even dumber is that this is a mid generation upgrade. Like we've seen this movie. Well, this is essentially the equivalency of a PS4 Pro or, you know, the Xbox Series, uh, the Xbox One X was for a time, which means we know that in two or three years, this thing is worthless as they will most likely have a PS6 that's backwards compatible with all of this. In some ways might set us up to believe that the PS6 is going to retail at a thousand dollars or something. I have no idea, but it also scares me because of what it obviously means for physical media. Like Sony's out. That's what they're yeah. saying. Like, they're basically saying, like, look, yeah, we made that external disk drive. It'll work, but, like, whatever. Who cares anymore? That's not the future. Yeah, if they're and, not, if they don't have the SKU with it included in there, then they're, they're clearly no longer care. Yeah, I agree. Um, and that's depressing. Not shocking anymore, but depressing. Mm-hmm. And part of me wonders if this has something to do with the colossal failure of Concord. It's only partially. Now, the thing with this is this, this thing was built and, uh, you know, designed and, and then prices settled upon quite some time ago. I just wonder if at some point they were like, okay, this will probably come out at 600. And then the extreme failure of Concord made them go, Maybe we can eke an extra hundred dollars out of this thing because this is our big thing this year. We don't have another game coming up that anybody is really getting all over. Um, this is going to be the GTA Six machine. Maybe if we increase this by a hundred bucks, since people are going to buy it anyway in their thought process, I mind you, uh, this will compensate for the losses of Concord. I, I that's pure speculation. Obviously, it's possible. It, it one of my friends who I was talking to at work about this also brought up a good point. It's entirely possible that they're not actually expecting a lot of people to actually buy this one, and it's purely just exists for the few people who keep complaining that the PS5 can't actually handle the games it's playing, which is entirely possible. I mean, it, you would think the research and development that went into it would be a bit much for that, but if it just exists as a thing to get like that market of very low market of people who were like, I need to have this playing everything the best it could possibly play, but I also don't want a gaming PC. Um, so what, the Rolls Royce market? Yeah. If it's that, if it's for that, then I guess it kind of makes sense. But at the same time, just to put that out there, um, at least as far as demographically goes, like with my, with my income and my living situation of living alone and having no dependents and not even having a pet. That should be me, and my first reaction about hearing hearing it at 700 bucks was to laugh. So, like, I, <laughs> dude, so I, 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 I live alone. I don't have a pet. I don't have dependents. I own an Apple Pippin. I just got a PV-1000 by Casio. I own a bunch of obscure, stupid things. You know, there are things on my list of things I want to get video game-wise that no one should ever really want. Uh, not, not in a practical sense. Like, I want the Joy Sound Festa, which is a Sega Saturn, you know, karaoke unit. Or, sorry, Joy Sound Festa was the Wii U version of that. There's the Prologue mm-hmm. 21, which is the Sega Saturn version. I want that. I have the Joy Sound Festa. All these stupid things combined, I still want them. This, and I said it in my tweet, no thanks. I don't want this. This does not, this is not expensive because it's some obscure thing that only came out in one country under some weird circumstance, and I understand that that's what it's going to cost me to get it retroactively 30 years later. 
Mm -hmm. This is something being released now in mass to a wide audience that I'm expected to tolerate because if I want it that bad, I can also go out and buy their little patch kit for an extra 80 bucks that makes it usable all in service of nothing. I find that insulting. Yeah. And insulting. like in my, in my case, I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily need the disc drop. I mean, I would cause I have PS five games that are on disc, but like, I have a gaming PC, and I'm perfectly fine buying games digitally. I mean, granted, I, if I have the option between the two, I'll do phys physical. But like, I don't have your if it's not a if it doesn't have a physical drive, it's not a game console mindset necessarily. Sure. But even me, and but even me, like I'm a software dev. Like it, the, the price, the price is like the price. Like if I wanted this, I would be like, okay, what do I need to? Oh, I need to just not eat out like a couple of some a certain number of times this month, and I could get it. I still look at that like for what it is and what they're charging, and my immediate reaction is to laugh. That's not good. I agree because I mean even the the stand thing, which is like probably like ten cents worth of plastic. Yeah, like, people are three D printing these things. And you have the audacity to not only not include it, but to make it $30 and apparently to s require it, essentially. Like, what's next? What else? I, I, it's getting to a point where it's like, what else are we willing to tolerate? Like, when... I know this actually did happen. Nintendo did this at one point. Where they... One of the 3DS models, they just didn't include the power supply. And they said, you have to get that on your own. Like, at what point... Does it get to that level of basic where we're just expected to put up with? And there's always defenders of this kind of thing. It's, there's always the well, just you know, just put, it's a couple extra bucks. Go get another cable. It's like, dude, at some point you have to care about your own rights. You have to stop trading that away for no reason. Hey, now, yeah, at least with the power supply thing, there was at least some weird regulation in Europe that meant that they couldn't actually ship it. Like, sure. what's Sony's excuse here, really? Besides, I want money. Yeah. I mean, I don't pretend to know the R&D of this thing. I really don't. I also don't pretend to know exactly what their manufacturing situation is. I don't know if these are going to be part of the new... The change in... Um, the change... I don't want to talk politics, but the changing geopolitical situation where a lot of stuff like this is not going to be made in China for much longer. It'll start being made in Mexico. I don't know if that's relevant to why production costs have gotten more expensive. I don't know if any of this stuff is a factor or if this is purely just Sony said, we can get away with this, so we're going to. Because even in my tweet, which I have to admit blew up, mm -hmm. especially for one of mine, uh, there, most people were on the same page we are, and this is not catering to this normal base that listens to this podcast or watches my content generally. This one kind of broke through and got through to the masses. Right. While most people seemed on board with the, I'm not paying for this, there were definitely people that were taking the exact opposite side. Not because like, oh, this is exciting and I'm looking forward to the future of PlayStation. It was more, I'm celebrating the death of physical media. Those guys exist. Oh, yeah, they're, idi they're complete idiots, but they exist. Now, to be very clear, you don't have to like physical media. You don't have to require needing it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But to celebrate the destruction and termination of your own rights as a consumer... That makes you a moron. Um, but anyway, that's obviously not you. Um, but yeah, so that's just me responding to the idiocy that can happen on Twitter. <laughs> but right. my point is, with all of this, is I I genuinely don't think this is something I would be getting, especially at that price point. Like, in the United States, it's $780 before tax. And because tax sales tax in the U.S. varies from literally county to county of the entire country. Uh, the cheapest it can possibly be is if you pick it up in a state with no sales tax, like Alaska, Oregon, New Hampshire, Delaware, or even one of the territories like Guam specifically, then you could get it at the cheapest point is $780. Some parts of the country, your sales tax, I think it's uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands and American Samoa have it the worst at like 13 to 15%. 
most of the country does between six and ten. Mm-hmm. The idea that you're gonna you're gonna get north of uh, even if you want that stand too. The idea that you're gonna get around nine hundred dollars for a video game console that isn't some weird obscure retro thing that only a handful of people ever wanted is obscene and offensive. Yeah. It just is. <laughs> And it's not even it's not even like the case where this is the where Sony is only putting their games on their console. Like they're putting their games on PC now, so it's like like sure you, you, they're not putting them on the PC at the same time usually. Unless, if it's not like a multiplayer game like Concord or like Helldivers, what was but like Spider Man and Spider Man Miles Morales made it to Steam. Spider-Man 2 is, so Spider-Man 2 is probably going to make it to Steam at some point. So, like, sure, you'll have to wait a while, but it's not even, it's not even like that there will be games that you will never be able to play if you don't buy this PS5 Pro. Or the PS5, for that matter. Especially because you have to assume, again, it's an assumption, that the PS6 will have some measure of backwards compatibility, although I would be very surprised at this point if it had disc-based compatibility anymore. Yeah. Um, but that's a, di- that's a different discussion. This is just... It, it, if I didn't know better, dude, I would almost wonder if they want this thing to fail. Like, if, if, it was, if this was Microsoft... It, it, like literally it, it, picture it if this was microsoft right now you and i would be having a conversation about this is them throwing a token thing out there saying hey look we're still trying to make consoles you guys just didn't buy it so we're going to switch to all software but right, with sony yeah. with sony they don't have the infrastructure for that yeah this is that, their that thing can't be, that can't be sony's plan because that would basically kill sony like, I, Hence, are, is PlayStation still the only thing that makes them money, or did they finally like no, they, they start making other, money in other places now? They've got they got places they got other departments that are doing all right. Uh, their movie okay. is actually doing pretty decent now, but like this just this perplexes me. This the this the most logical answer to me in this whole thing is is actually just an insane level of not understanding the market that they are in. Like this is, there are too many people in too many positions of power at Sony that don't really understand this market, but are just the ones in charge. The ones who have, the and keys. don't remember the PS three. Yeah. Cause they didn't work there. That wasn't their problem. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's this comes off. Like you just fundamentally do not get it. Um, because if this was your strategy and you genuinely think like that everybody's just going to be like, oh yeah, dude, I'm going to pay nearly 800 bucks for a, like a mid generation upgrade on a system that has been kind of meh this. Uh, so I'll tell you this right now as the guy who carries around the Sega Pluto, right? The whole thing with the Sega Pluto was that Sega was working on an upgraded version of the Saturn with a built-in modem, built-in hard drive. It would have had, like, the Sega channel, so think modern-day Game Pass for the Saturn. It would have retailed for $550, which is a lot now, but that would have been in 1997. They canceled it. And that is one of the few times I would say Sega had incredible foresight on to not actually pull the trigger on some hardware. Yeah. Like this, this feels like that. This, this, feel, this except that they did it. Yeah. It, it, this feels like something that they should have can should have canceled, or if they if if they couldn't get it at a lower price, just flat out. Like all like, I can think. You go ahead. Sorry. Like, like like say I I I watched the presentation. Like I saw the gameplay footage. Like. Yeah, cool. It definitely does look better, and it is nice if that everything is consistently at sixty. But if you don't, but if you already have a PS Five, it's not worth another seven hundred bucks. Yeah the the only argument I could have seen for this would have been if you look. This is going to sound stupid because we're still too far away from it. But the only argument I could have seen where people would be much less miffed about this 
would be if it also included obviously a digital version of GTA 6 that also came with like a ton of the in-game credit and they were literally trying to sell this as like the GTA 6 machine you know and you still had that price point it would still be obscene but I think a lot less people would be upset because like everybody oh, yeah. wants that game all the kinds everyone would be you... like okay yeah it's GTA 6 plus the plus the credits I mean that that would shave down the price closer down to like 600. Yeah, Which... the, I think people would have been more inclined to to get on board with that. Now, obviously, they're not going to do that because they don't, you know, Rockstar doesn't want to have their lunch eaten and nor does Sony want to give them that money. But, like, uh, I mean, maybe we'll all get proven wrong and there is some market out there where this thing sells like crazy. But I don't know. I, saw, I actually had one guy in the comments saying he was saving this whole um, thread, referring to my tweet, uh, because he wanted to see when the sales of this thing are absolutely astonishing and he comes back and just laughs at everybody who thought this wasn't going to pan out. Uh, maybe that guy will be right, but I really doubt it. I mean, it. maybe he, maybe he will, but it's like, at, I mean, maybe if this was like, I mean, if this was like two years ago and this was coming out at that price, I mean, we would be probably still be like, what the fuck? But oh, it, no, we definitely would have, the, we would have, but like, to do that in 2024 is like, ugh. like I think I mean think like the last two years. Well, okay, yeah, I mean 2022 it was right when this was started, but like the last two years, like the tech sector has been like firing people left and right. The tech people are people who are into tech stuff usually, um, like not always, like not all of them are into video games, but they're the ones who are into tech stuff usually. And they're the ones with the, the ridiculous income to be, look at the look at something like this and be like, yeah, yeah, we're the ones who could be like, yeah, I mean, we could do that. I mean, granted, like I I fit in there, but I'm not like, but I'm not interested in it. But that's partial. I mean, that's mostly because like I looked at it like for the upgrade from what I already have. I'm like, that's not worth an extra paying seven hundred bucks. Like. And also, but also, like, I don't I don't play my PS5 enough as is. It's basically a Sony exclusive machine that I'm machine. So, like, last time I played it was Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. But, like, the people who are, like, in my job field are losing their jobs. And they keep losing their jobs. And game devs keep losing their jobs. And they're the ones with the jobs with the money who are most likely to be able to afford this stuff. So it's like, ugh. like yeah. what does Sony think? I mean, the only thing, like, either, if my friend is right and it's just for those, like, Rolls Royce game console market type deal people, or if it's just a case of this is as low as we could actually do it without, like, going bankrupt, it, but in which case that's a, just eat what your dev, dev car costs and don't release the thing. Yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know. I this We obviously don't have the full story because I can paint so many alternative reasons why this might have not, might have happened. This could be delusions of grandeur. You know, this could just be something where they just genuinely do not understand their market. This could be something where they bet the entire year on this. Because, like, literally last year, uh, I think it was my pickup, my, um, ps4 or ps5 anniversary video last year i was talking about how this was probably going to happen this year and that it was going to be their big thing because they didn't really have another game coming up and that's still true and clearly it's it's happening so like they might have been so far in development on this thing where they were just like we don't have a choice we have to release this this could be you know not all clearly based on concord not everything is clicking over there you yeah. know so so like it's possible they just said we have no choice and maybe their version of making it cheaper was getting rid of a disc model, you know, cause they, they're like, look, we'll make those separately. If people want to spend an extra 80 bucks, if they care enough about that. Sure. Um, some people are blaming it on the two terabyte SSD that's in there, which I guess is a potential factor, but then, you know, that's where you go. I don't know. One terabyte perhaps. Um, wasn't like, one terabyte I, was in the base PS five though. Yeah, I'm not saying that okay. would have been. It's uh, was it one? I thought it was five twelve gig, but I could be wrong. Um, 
I could definitely be wrong about that. Because it was, what's that other, it's not a standard SSD. What's that, like, um, the one that looks like RAM? I'm forgetting the name of the it. The M2. That, yeah, that, yeah. that. I think that's what's in the PS5, so that makes sense. I, I don't know. I just, I, to me, this feels like either a serious misunderstanding of them and their base, or they were just forced to do it in the sense they have nothing else, and they're very much banking on GTA 6 to really bail them out. Because here's the, the wider problem with Sony is when I look at Microsoft, I can tell what their plan is. Even if it's not working, they clearly we know what they were doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Granted, they're kind of restructuring, but that's what they want to do. Nintendo is very content being off in a corner. Everybody sees that, and it works well for them. You know, you look at Steam, and that's that's a given. They've completely dominated, effectively, the PC market. With Sony, I don't think they know what they want to do. I think they kind of want to try all of it, and they can't do any of it. You know, they, they kind of like to compete in the same space as Nintendo. That's why you got it for a bit there. You had the handhelds. Now you kind of have PlayStation Portal. Uh, I think they want to compete in the Xbox space, so they, you know, they throw out Obviously, they, they throw out console gaming, and they continue to do that, and they, they throw out more uh, digital attempts, <clears throat> digital attempts, but nothing that really works too well. And obviously, they're not very good with the PC side of stuff, but they do try to throw their games out there, too, just to collect some of that revenue. And because they're not really good at any one of those three things, they're kind of just coming off like they don't really know what to do. Well, at, at least with the PC thing, what they're doing makes sense. They don't want to cannibalize PlayStation entirely. But they don't want to not, but they do know that there's money that they're leaving on the table by not putting their games on PC. So that yeah. that's why that they're, that's why, like, when Spider-Man 2 was coming out, Spider-Man Remastered ended up on Steam. Yeah. Like, around that time. But oh, Even though we could probably talk about this for, like, an hour or more, it's already been about 42, so we'll we'll, mm -hmm. we'll have to move on here to uh, another subject um so right now uh yeah, we're going to uh cut away to our first cameo here this actually uh is going to be abdullah now again abdullah would have been here but due to technical issues he couldn't be so i actually don't know what he said i asked him a question he recorded it this is well this will be his response to the following question because of all of this would you bet? Would you rather buy one PS5 Pro for seven hundred and eighty dollars plus tax, or ten PS5 physical copies of Concord? And explain yourself as to why. I mean, I'll probably answer that from a collector perspective, given that I'm I am a video game collector. So I would see that if I do have the money, I would probably buy uh, the. 10 copies um, purely because I'm speculating that it'll just get more expensive as time goes on I mean uh, I don't know much about it but uh, I do know that prices are going up uh, I mean I I just looked it up on eBay like sell nine and keep one or sell all of them when uh, the time comes so if I were to talk about this podcast and my and, you know being in it and the podcast itself in general, I guess the thing I would say that to me it's just like some sort of it's not some sort of, it is a dream come true. I mean I've been following uh, Adam uh, on uh, you know social media. I've been an avid watcher of his uh, YouTube channel and uh, very chill, very nice guy and you know very knowledgeable. Adam, I learned a lot, a lot from you to be honest. Uh before this podcast, I used to think that I know quite well. I have a good grasp, you know, of the no of some of generic uh, or general history of video games. But to be honest, whenever I discuss a topic with you and uh, Rob, of course, uh, at the times Rob, you know, when he was on the podcast regularly, and even whenever uh, whenever <laughs> Rob showed up, I mean, you guys, when you guys talk about it, I just it's it's like talking it's like a student speaking to a professor you guys have really really vast knowledge and uh, I learned a lot from that in addition I got exposed to a lot of new things you guys talk about things that I've never 
you know uh, thought of trying and I see you guys comments and uh, that all by itself the atmosphere behind it and you know people um, w people might think in general that okay if you get to quote unquote meet your heroes it's not gonna be a great thing oh it may turn out not as good as you think but honestly in 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 full seriousness I never ever had a problem with Adam with with communication whatsoever so overall this podcast has really you know made me a better or more knowledgeable person in terms of video games I got to discuss things and talk about things with people who I admire and people who I see as idols people who helped me get to, to be the gamer or collector that I am now um, congratulations on 100 episodes and I really hope that I could continue to be part of this uh, as much as I can. Well, thank you, Abdullah, for that answer. Appreciate it and the kind words about the podcast. Now, uh, we're going to move on. Joseph is back here with me. Uh, we're going to uh, do a new subject, Joseph. This one comes from us from a Patreon backer whose name is Sinjeet. Uh, he tends to like his alternate reality uh, video game history, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I mean that he likes to, to have us speculate on what would have happened if this had happened, you know? Um, and But this month he did not have a subject, so I selected one on his behalf. <laughs> uh, the question is... So I don't, Joseph, I think I, I did mention it to you earlier. Yesterday at the time of this recording, which was September 9th, uh, 2024. Uh, while we obviously knew of it as like the Dreamcast birthday, I had done a video on it. There was another anniversary that flew under the radar. It actually was the uh, 30th anniversary of the Neo Geo CD. Uh, and so I thought it would be kind of fun to just kind of wax inane about a timeline where the Neo Geo CD did way better than it did. What do you think? Um, huh. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to think about this for a while. When, since you know, spoiler, I knew what the I knew well, what the I, topic I, was before we did this. If you, spoilers, yes. If you're ever on the show, there's very <laughs> rarely do I'm like, hey guys, I'm just gonna expect you to just know everything encyclopedically. I, I let them know basically what the questions are gonna be because this is not a a gotcha interview here. <laughs> like we're trying to have a discussion. Uh, yeah. But yes. That said, go ahead. But honestly, like, the Neo Geo CD is a weird one to think about this about, because really, the for what it was meant to do, it ba like it basically did what it was meant to do. It was basically just an SNK arcade game port machine, delivery, ve delivery vehicle that didn't cost a stupid ridiculous amount of money and only possibly cost a ridiculous amount of money. I don't actually know how much the Neo Geo CD retailed for. So, like, a timeline where that, like, somehow magically, like, does a ridiculous, like, amount of, like, amount of sales to the point where we're like, yeah, we have to actually, like, include this, like, when we're talking about the fifth gen of game consoles, like, because it was out around fourth, the same time. Before. Fourth. Fourth. Wasn't it's the, the Neo it's the Geo last, C No, it's the last fourth gen console. It's actually weird. It came out even though it was the last fourth gen console, there had already been fifth gen consoles that came out. That one is a very unique case because from a hardware perspective, it was just a disc version of a Neo Geo AE. Oh yeah, no, which, I, I knew hardware wise it's fourth gen, but yeah, it, time in a timeline yeah. where it actually does well, we we would be considering it fifth gen. If like if it like unless like if it does in this case does well, I mean like competitive with at least the n64 levels of do well like it, it in that scenario it's like what what actually happens does snk go huh i i, I guess i i guess we're gonna make like a real console next time or we're gonna make another one like do they do they make like their next gen um make, like, a next-gen version of the AES slash Neo Geo CD um, for the 6th gen or 5th gen game, arcade games that they have. Like, it, it's hard to know what they're going to do because all the Neo Geo CD was was the... was the... M, was it the MVS or the AES? Which... What are you saying? The console or the... 
Yeah, they're they're well, the console is the AES. The console is uh, the AES. Okay. So it was basically just to be a cheaper AES that, you know, games could actually retail for less than, like, 300 to, like, however ridiculous 100 so bucks that those big carts cost. So, like, I really don't know where Neo Geo, where, like, a successful timeline where Neo Geo ZD is, like, actually successful goes. It's either exactly the same, except maybe, like, one of the mergers SNK did... At one point, that ended up with them doing a bunch of Pachinko stuff for a while. Never happens. Maybe. If it's that successful. Or could end up with them being the... Them being the new console that joins up and crowds out the Xbox. We really have no idea where they could have gone with... Well, maybe not because the Xbox was Microsoft. But, like, we don't know if they would have made a 6th gen game console or not. Because we don't really know, because it's not like the Neo Geo CD was a failure, from what I understand, right? It 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 had its market, but it was actually it's funny because this goes back to our PS Five discussion. It was kind of the Rolls Royce market, like at least the AES was. Uh, the CD. Now here's the, I, while you, while you were talking, I'm I'm sorry, I did a little bit of googling, but I wanted to find something out specific to make this point. Um, the CD was actually introduced to make the system cheaper, logically so, because if you didn't have to make those really ridiculous cartridges, then you could probably sell the, the console and make a little bit of money off of it and hopefully get it into more homes. Do you know what the system retailed for and when? Nope. So its last release was actually in the U.S., and it wasn't until 1996. It had launched in Japan uh, in, in uh, 1994. So we got it two years later. We got it for, and this is by the time the, the development had been cheaper, we got it for $399 retail in 96. Adjusted for inflation, that is $814, almost $815 actually, which means the PS5 Pro is cheaper. Okay, so, so maybe what we were thinking about earlier with PS5, it just sounds bad, it's not actually... As bad as we thought, but either oh, way, really? <laughs> well, it still sounds bad, but like, yeah, well, the the how many units of the Neo Geo CD were sold again? Good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Actually, I, I should now. I actually want to know. Uh. So forgive for keyboards noises. Neo Geo CDs were sold. How? <laughs> For the entire three-year run of the Neo Geo CD, it sold 570,000 units. Okay, so yeah, it's still bad. <laughs> um, now, granted, that's 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 very anecdotal information there. But yeah, we're not trying to bring this back around to the PS5. I, I am trying to stay this, keep this on Neo Geo CD. Because I actually do like the Neo Geo CD. It's a system I enjoy collecting for. I have almost a full set of it, but there's like a few heavy hitters I'm, I'm simply never going to possess. Um it's cool that it's 30 years old now, at least the Japanese release is. But, yeah, imagining a timeline where the system worked out, there, there's no way they... The, the obvious mistake they made was the bad disk drive as far as uh, the speeds. But it was just too expensive, those disk drives, to make them cheaper at the time in which they produced the system. Uh, eventually you would get that in the CDZ, but it, that one was prohibitively expensive. I think they only made like 25,000 of those. So if they had somehow made that system back in 1994 and somehow had sold it for like $200, then I think they might have had a lot more success as far as sales. But I, that's very easy for me to say, given that that's an extra two years of technology I'm just phasing out and it's literally selling it for half of it. So right. basically, to your point, I don't really think there was any way it could have worked other than magical solutions. <laughs> like, well, I mean, um, yes, but I mean, to be fair, the question was: imagine a timeline where it where it worked yeah. out. I know this like, is the same so... problem we always have. Well, this is the problem we had with the Apple Pippin. Like, it's the same question: like, how do you f make it work? And the answer well, we tend to come it, to is it can't. <laughs> like, well, the Apple Pippin question was just: what if Steve Jobs didn't kill it? This one. Sure, is but assuming it still fails. that it actually worked out, and so sure, we don't have to actually figure out how that happens. We just oh, okay, all right, all right. After 
sense. Okay, so, all right, then fine. I will adjust the reframe it. So, okay, yes, it comes out in 1994, and everyone just goes ham. They don't even care that it costs the equivalency of $816 or $17 in 2024 money. They just go nuts. Everybody's buying it like crazy. You can't keep them on the shelves. It's gangbusters. It's selling like PS2 levels, 160 million units. Wow. If that happened... Obviously, uh, SNK would still be making consoles, or at least they would have for quite some time. Uh, that would have been really cool. Yeah, I, I don't see any scenario in which they didn't persist after that as far as console development. If they had seen that level of success, it, it, yeah, of course they would have. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah but like I was saying earlier, it's just like, yeah, obviously if they had that level of success, then yes, they absolutely would have made a new console because... Why wouldn't they? They, they just basically, they, they would have at that point basically either somehow come into first place or came in second with inferior hardware to like anyone who was actually relevant. Because like you, like you said, hardware wise, this was a fourth gen console. Yep. So like, yeah. obviously they then at that point are like, well, I guess we have to try to make a real one this time. Yeah, that would have been an interesting alternate dynamic because, again, the, you were right. The premise of the question is, what if it was successful? In order to make it successful, we have to make certain charitable changes to it. Uh, the The thing is, they entered it into a fourth gen mindset with like a apparently a ninth gen budget <laughs> for a fifth gen market. So it's like you did everything kind of wrong. So that's that's why that didn't really pan out. Mm -hmm. um, all the same, I do love that system. I actually think it's um, when you I don't know how there, if there's a term for this exactly, but when you like look at the overall library of a console and you see like the caliber of the games on it, you can typically kind of average them all out. So like, you know, a good system like a Dreamcast where like a very, very large number of the games on that system are very good. And there's actually very small amounts of shovelware. You know, your Spirit of Speed 1937s will, of course, come to mind. But, like, with, but the, there's a very high amount. Then there's, like, the flip side where you have something like the Nintendo Wii where it's got, like, yeah, it does have a Super Mario Galaxy on it or whatever. But it also has, like, every other Wii game ever made. So it's f terrible. Um, there's an average there, a curve, if you will. And I think in that context the neo geo cd is actually a very good video game console where the vast majority of the games are good to great there are a few that are not that good but like i would argue that if you're getting a neo geo cd especially if you're into fighting games that's a game console you will right love. you're yeah. right i mean it was the sna smk's console for snk games yeah like exactly like very that, little that's what it was support. for <laughs> yeah like, All right. Oh, go ahead. Well, like I was good. I was just about to say, like, I think you you then answered it before I could say the question was like, was there any third party support on the Neo Geo CD? There was very very little. Uh, Visco. I mean, I actually made the mistake of thinking there was none. There was a little bit. It was just kind of pitiful and token. Uh, this company called Visco did a few. Uh, I can't remember the other ones offhand. Funny enough, Visco was sort of not bought out, but is working with Josh Prod. So, like, a lot of Visco's archives actually got le uh, legitimate licensed ports to the Dreamcast, which is kind of funny. Um, wow. Like Breakers. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a while ago. Anyway, yeah, there was a few others, but that's fine. So, just giving a little shout out to the Neo Geo CD on its 30th birthday. Happy belated, buddy. Um, and before we move on though, I'm going to get a little hokey, Joseph, since you have been on the podcast for a few years here, uh, I just want to ask you if you have any thoughts you would like to give directly to the audience, uh, before we part ways on this particular episode. I mean, well, I mean, not necessarily like to the audience, but I have, I do have to say it's really been great being on this podcast every month for, I mean, now, obviously, I'm supporting you on Patreon to do that, but, like, it's been two years. Like, if I wasn't enjoying this and didn't look forward to this every month, I would have stopped by now. Or at least I would have dropped down to, like, a lower tier or something. But it's been a blast talking to you on about all this, about all the topics that we've talked about over the years. Even, even if most of the time it seems like a lot of time we end up talking about Microsoft stuff. It's actually, <laughs> well, it's it's actually refreshing we got to talk about Sony's mistakes for once. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, it's, I think, I mean, granted, that's a completely different discussion. It's like, yeah, I, I don't know. Microsoft makes mistakes more often, but Sony makes bigger ones. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, go on. But like, like I said, I, it's been really great being on here and I'm hoping that I get to be on here for several more months for at least for sure. But job market will job market. So we'll see what happens. Well, yes, but. obviously I'm rooting for you too. Not only for obvious financial reasons, but also because, yeah, I just like having you on the show as well. You're, you're good at it. So I hope to keep, uh, keep that around. Hope you keep you around and everything. And that'll be awesome. It's always good to have uh, great fellow uh, hosts who can really, you know, help thrust the conversation forward and make it in- engaging and interesting to the audience. So thank you for very much for what you've done for this podcast so far. You're welcome. <laughs> With that uh, sentiment out of the way, uh, we're going to give a round of shout-outs to other Patreon backers who are at the level in which they get a shout-out. So that would be Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Once again, that is Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, Tim Inman, and Trey Wagner. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon. Of course, everybody out there, as a reminder, if at any time you want to get early access to this, get shout-outs, pick a subject, or maybe even potentially be on here one day, Uh, All that information is available in the description. Just go to the Patreon page. Appreciate the support so much. Thank you so much. And we are back with our first former host cameo. Rob, the evil Rob Thanos. Really, really the only host cameo that matters. Not to disparage those who are going to come later in the podcast or came first in the podcast history, but I'm really the only one that matters. Your word's not mine. Your word's not mine. That's how you know he's the super villain of all the uh, potential of all the former hosts. You know, it's like it's like the former president's club, and you're just that one that won't hang out with anybody because you're weird. And, you know, perhaps but, I uh, treated you uh, too harshly. <laughs> now, in in honor of James Earl Jones, it's just uh, <laughs> you think you're being treated unfairly. <laughs> Be unfortunate if I had to leave a garrison here. <laughs> the, the Lord Vader of our podcast. Um, but anyway, um, so welcome back, Rob, for your uh, little cameo time. And we appreciate having you here for the 100th yeah. episode. Um, so first thing I want to ask you is a random question. Now, to everybody out there, Rob has no idea what the previous subject was. And therefore, he's going to have no idea where this question is coming from. But I just want a short, succinct answer of what he would do. Okay, Rob. Would you rather have 30 Neo Geo CDs or 100 episodes of this podcast? I mean, what would I do with 30 Neo Geo CDs? Like, network them together to a supercomputer? I, I'm not I'm not telling you what you would or would not do with any of this content. It's really just a matter of what would you do and why. Like a hundred more episodes of this podcast or the pre-existing hundred episodes? No, just, uh, I can't explain that part. 100 episodes or 30 Neo Geo CDs. Both exist in this universe. Oh, let the past die. Kill it if you have to. So that would apply to both? Uh, no, I'll take the Neo Geo. Yeah, no, that's the correct answer. That's objectively. Like, it's, it's like, you get 30 Neo Geo CDs. You can keep one, is, sell 29, make a bank. Is, is, does the Neo Geo CD include a CDZ? Or is it just front I, and top I, letters? I, it's, just the, the, it's just 30 Neo Geo CDs. I guess you don't know. It could be a hot trade. Think of it as like one of those big eBay lots. Oh, you, know, okay. just, you, don't know, you don't know what's coming in there. So you might have a bunch of problems. A bunch of might need repairs. Who really knows? But all right, the, he has the, chosen. The problem. And we appreciate him. The problem I, I would have would if 30 Neo Geo CDs arrived on my doorstep is my wife divorcing me. Really? So then maybe you need 100 episodes of this podcast. Instead. No, I'd, I'd rather take the divorce. No, okay. Because, I mean, that, that implies you want a divorce because we are at 100 episodes. So that already exists. So now, sorry, Tina, I guess he's leaving you over the 100th episode. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, well, I mean, if she didn't leave me over having to, you know record you know what how many episodes have i been on i don't know i don't keep i got pro- i mean i was i was on the podcast for effectively four years so okay at least mathematically at, it would at be at like least 40, 40 but i don't yeah, yeah but at you, least you 40, also yeah. weren't around a lot so probably around 40 would be a good answer yeah yeah okay. roughly 40 
All right, well, whatever. I, I don't care. So he went with the Neo Geo CDs. <laughs> we're going with that. So we're going to move on. Um, so uh, we're doing this in place of Abdullah, as you guys uh, you, you might have noticed. He couldn't really be here uh, other than in cameo form. So uh, this was the subject he had wanted to s discuss. And Rob, I think this is absolutely perfect for you. The question is... Uh, what can we talk about an alternate universe where the GameCube is actually the one that won the sixth generation? Like, what would have had to have been changed? How would everything have played out? Your take on all of this? I mean, deep down, didn't the GameCube really win the sixth gen? No. I mean, deep, deep down, like in your hardest of hearts, don't you know no. that the GameCube already won? No. I mean, I assume you're, it's basically sales. That's your... your Sales would be the metric, yes. The metric, okay. <laughs> um, like, I'll give it credit. It beat the Dreamcast and the new one. But it was third out of five. True. But it won in our hearts. I like the GameCube quite a bit. I don't agree with that statement. As I would think a lot of people would say they prefer... Something like the Dreamcast or the PlayStation or even the Xbox over it. I don't think that anybody will be fighting you too much on the the new one though. I don't. I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't work all the time at Digital Press anymore. I basically run their social media. But every time I'm in a store, in the storefront, I feel that the system of that generation with the most cultural relevance in 2024 is the GameCube, in terms of what we sell what draws people into the store to buy things uh, and what people are in general are excited to look for. It's not the original Xbox. It's not the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast has its niche fans. Don't get me wrong. You know, anytime we get a new piece of software from video games, in New York, or like a lot of cool games, people come in for it. Uh, PS2. Like, I mean, you could maybe make an argument for that, but I we definitely sell more PS2 games than GameCube just because there's so many more and they're not as expensive. But what are people excited for and what are people asking about? It's the GameCube. So that's why I say it won. So your answer to the hypothetical question about what would happen in an alternate universe where it won is that we don't have to visit it because it already won even though it didn't? It already won. So that's it? That's your answer? Uh, I mean, in my heart, yes. That's the answer to that question. It did It did win. It took a long time. It lost, you know, it lost the battles, but it won the war. Well, on that note, I think I will save this question for someone else <laughs> who's more competent, and we will have a better discussion another time in the future. <laughs> okay, but I mean, to, 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 to within the the boundaries of your metrics, uh, of how how do you create a path to the GameCube winning those battles in the sixth generation of consoles? Um, I think a lot of it has to do with. I think you could boil it down to two factors. One, the mini DVDs, um, not being a full size, not being able to hold uh, the amount of space that was required for most games in the sixth generation. You know, that's why you didn't get big cross platform games, tentpole releases on the GameCube. You only got them on the PS2 and Xbox. And if you did get a multiplat on the GameCube, it would either be neutered in some way, shape, or form, or it would be spread across multiple discs. Um, so the disc size would in absolutely encourage more developers to port their games to the GameCube. And then my second. Uh, deciding thing would really be the lack of online play. Um, the 6th gen was the first time that stable online multiplayer really, really came to the forefront of gaming uh, with games like Halo or SOCOM, um, you know, on the uh, Xbox and PlayStation, re uh, respectively. But uh, the GameCube only had, you know, effectively... Uh, one series of online capable games, which is the Fantasy Star Online. 
games, which were already released on the Dreamcast, so they weren't even like an exclusive game to that system. And I think even this, I think it even got released on the Xbox if I it did I'm yes. correct yeah so it wasn't even exclusive by any metrics to um, be fair the uh fantasy star online part three was but that was like a weird card <clears throat> game or whatever yeah yeah um so or fantasy star whatever it was there's yeah it yeah wasn't, ca- yeah card you know card revol- card revolution yeah yeah uh, that one uh, fantasy star three so um i think it's interesting to think okay obviously online multiplayer would have been good but you know what game would have or series would have been like Nintendo's tentpole online franchise. Um, I mean, you think now it's a uh, Smash Brothers, it's Mario Kart, it's Splatoon, um, but they didn't really have a third, uh, a first party franchise at that time that I would have said would have been their killer app. Their Halo killer, as it were. You know, that was a buzzword back in the early 2000s. Um, you know, what would have been their online they, game? I really don't know. They tried to do it with Metroid Prime. Yeah, Metroid Prime 2 did have a multiplayer mode. That is that is correct. Um, but, I mean, that was very basic multiplayer. I mean, you no, would... No, no, you I, would, I agree. You would, ex- you would ex- quickly exhaust your... Um, your desire to play just because it didn't have you know that ecosystem built up like a Halo or SOCOM uh, did back in that day. So I mean, you would either have to adapt something like a Metroid with a hyper focus on multiplayer and expanding upon that, or you would have to partner with some third party developer to really secure an exclusive game that would have been you know nintendo's big online app because really you need one big online uh game and then the rest kind of follow the you know the rest rise to meet that game if halo was an excess a success on the xbox and they didn't have you know maybe you would have had all of those 2k games um come on and have online you wouldn't have had uh, other third-party companies really dedicate to Xbox Live. It's kind of an unknown quantity. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll just do the follow-up to that part then. Okay, let's assume under all these conditions everything changed, and yes, they won. Now, I take it then that do you think, if you want to wax poetic about it, we would never have gotten the Wii that we got. We would have gotten instead a more maybe like the Wii U right away, you know, just a seventh gen console that more accurately matched the 360 or PS3 capabilities. I don't know because even in the, uh, generations that prior, pre- previous generations that Nintendo quote unquote won, um, in the sales sales war, they always, they, they very rarely, uh, iterated on their console they usually tried to innovate in some way shape or form um you know the super nintendo is kind of the one that it didn't do that the nes clearly won the third generation and the super nintendo was just a super nes um but after that they really revolutionized their gameplay development and the types of games that they were doing with the n64 N64 failed um, to to win that race, so they did the GameCube, and they kind of introduced a lot of uh, you know different peripherals, microphones, and the bongos and things. So they were kind of trending in that direction to have an alternate style of gameplay that the Wii was known for. Um, so I don't know if they would have done that. I think f- at least at the start. The, the Wii was looked at by hardcore gamers, I'm sure yourself included, that when you found out about the motion controls, and like, oh my god, that's going to be amazing. You're going to be able to do like first-person shooters and like actually aim the controller. That's awesome. Thinking of all these possibilities, it was only until you actually got the console and the controller in your hands that you realized that, okay, this is kind of dog shit. Um so I I really don't I really don't think that a GameCube being successful would have prevented them from doing the Wii, because 
I mean, third-party shovelware aside, Nintendo's first-party output for the Wii was fairly similar to the GameCube anyway. You still got big your big franchises your metroids your kirby's your zeldas your uh marios um they all got you know uh new featurettes on the on the wii so i don't know i think it, they would have stayed the course all right i mean i guess that's a take um i personally think that they would have done things slightly differently only because we have to remember that the wii was forged in the failure of the gamecube at least as it was perceived at the time if the wii is largely just recycled gamecube hardware on steroids you can make the case they might have been like oh that's another good reason to just recycle the gamecube it was so successful and so easy we can make money on the same console as opposed to salvaging it which is how it looks like now i agree with you in one simple point which is we simply do not know so you your take is that they probably wouldn't have. My take is they probably would have, but it probably wouldn't have been as capable as, say, the 360. I think everything was still kind of trending for them to at least trying to be somewhat hardware relevant. Not necessarily. People have made the argument in the past that Nintendo used to dominate and be the most powerful console. No. They really never, they never. Really never were. But they were at least, like, competitive in that arena. And I, I still think that if they had made something comparable to the Wii U, technologically speaking, um, to compete with the 360 and the PS3, uh, that to me would have felt very natural, uh, given the in a universe where the GameCube had been far more successful. Although how you define far more successful, I don't know. Uh, maybe an additional... 15 20 million units that's like where it was in order to win the generation it literally would have had a sold sell 130 like over, yeah million more <laughs> yeah exactly it's not even close um so yeah like in the scenario where the gamecube actually did sell let's say like 165 million units as opposed to like the 30 that it actually sold or whatever it was um yeah that that would be a pretty different world for nintendo because they would have obviously made far more money off the system and so i don't know i i it's hard to say i i personally think that they would have no doubt had gamecube support into whatever they built after that um just like they did ultimately in the wii i don't know if i believe that they would have just recycled the wii again or recycled the gamecube into the wii like they did but that's me but obviously we don't really know. So it's but, it's it's interesting we don't necessarily yeah. agree on that because that makes it I don't know dynamic. But, yeah, but uh, the cool. uh, I mean the GameCube like back then you have to remember that the GameCube was nearly on par with the Xbox in terms of graphical capability. Like I remember back in the day everybody laughing at the thought of play uh, of the PlayStation Two being able to run Resident Evil Four. And even today, if you look back on the port of Resident Evil 2 on the PS2, it's nowhere near what the GameCube looks. It looks like shit. It's probably the uh, worst way... There is way... no port of Resident Evil 2 on... Um, a Re Resident Evil 4 on the, on the PS2. Oh. My, 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 uh, my mistake. Yeah, so Resident Evil 4 on the PS2 looks like shit compared to the GameCube version. Um, it's probably the worst way today to be able to play Resident Evil 4. Um, when you have the remake and the remasters and all that. I, I don't know about that. Have you played the Zebo version? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm just being technical. All right, go ahead. At least that is just, that's, you know, uh, that's a special kind of garbage. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think Nintendo, they, I don't, up until very recently, literally the Wii U, Nintendo really didn't look at HD as the next generation of uh, of evolution in their console. That's why they kind of continued with the GameCube specs on steroids, as you said, with the Wii, I, I, because they I, thought the GameCube could just handle enough, you know, to make it okay. I agree with you be in the universe where they sold 30 million of them. What I'm asking is in a universe where they sold 165 million of them, what changes? Um, now the case can be made, and rightly so, that the NES or sorry, the Wii itself sold over 100 million units, and that didn't make the Wii U turn out to be competitive with, say, the PS4 out of the gate. That's yeah. fair. But then by that point, they were already effectively a technologically a generation behind. So that's that's something that we're always going to debate, and I think it's just kind of interesting that we don't necessarily agree on it, but we both have valid enough takes because it is just. You know, <laughs> it's no, it, no it, it is interesting because, I mean, the subject of this discussion, the GameCube was really 
I say the last time Nintendo tried to compete in, oh, terms, I agree of, in terms of specs. Like, even yeah. today, that system holds up really, really well in terms of its graphics. You're, you're able to take a game like Metroid Prime and just give it a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, bump up the resolution, and maybe smooth out a couple of, like, the textures and put it on the Switch, and it looks incredible, you know, with minimal effort. Um, even the Super Mario Sunshine, like, emulation that they did for uh, for the 3D All-Stars collection, it looks great. <laughs> you know, the GameCube holds up very, very well. Um, so it was, it was yep. pretty capable, you know. And if you think about a game like Super Mario Galaxy effectively running on GameCube hardware, um, you know, that the GameCube had a lot under the hood to offer. It really did. I don't dispute that. It, it definitely is a system that is far more future-proofed than some of its contemporary rivals. PS2! Oh, I will have a <laughs> Zebo. Well, no, I don't know if the Zebo even really... Was it attempted as a rival? <laughs> but, like, it doesn't mean... Well, in Brazil it was, yeah. <laughs> and Mexico, funny enough. Yeah. Um... Anyway, yes, I, I guess that'll do it there. Rob, thank you for returning for a cameo here. Appreciate having you around. Uh, and if there's any final thoughts you want to give on the podcast as a whole, please tell us now. Uh, had Always had a wonderful time on the podcast. Uh, I'm sure I'll be back you know, at, at some point when I get bored and hit up Adam. Um, but uh, thank you for listening. Uh, go watch our terrible unboxing video that we just did. Uh, to promote, but yeah, that did come out. Uh, well, that, <laughs> that video is interesting. so it's kind of got a hidden unboxing in it for anybody who has no <laughs> idea what we're talking about. Somehow listened to this, but didn't see that video. Um, look up a video I put out not too long ago that's called like uh, Karaoke Saturn, GBA DVD player, and more unboxing a 50 year old system rare variants. Basically, we were at Long Island Retro and they had this big museum area set up with all these like obscure video game consoles, a lot of which I don't even have. So I was like, oh, it'd be fun to kind of go around and talk about them. And then out of no where we were kind of thrust with the task from the convention that they they just bought something and they have to get it out of the box so they were about to tear it apart and we were like wait wait wait, wait. let us film this <laughs> and so we did that <laughs> so yeah, yeah what a piece there. of shit that was <laughs> yeah yeah that would be a correct assessment it was pretty funny though all right thank you rob for joining us if you've been watching the podcast we appreciate everybody who stuck around and all this time i know it was nice to obviously continue to hear from joseph you had your cameo from abdullah we got a nice cameo from rob there have been other guests uh on the show in our in the history of this though there was uh keith uh if you're listening to this keith i reached out to you keith was on the show for one year uh, but I never heard back from him, so I hope he's all right. I just I didn't hear anything, so uh, our mind, our hearts and minds are with you. Uh, going very far back, there was also another guy who was from France. He was only on the show for four episodes. His name is Remy. Uh, unfortunately, I have no way to contact him because back in the day, I think I used to reach out to him through like YouTube private messages when that was a thing. Like that's how far back this goes. But there was one other. There was our first ever guest who stuck around for nearly a year, has basically been gone ever since, and uh the ch the king, as it were, has returned. Welcome back, Chip. Bark -da -da -da. Hello. Man, it is good to have you back here, even if it is just kind of a cameo deal. I appreciate you you taking the time from your busy life to uh yeah. to talk to the folks again on this 100th episode um so yeah good to see you you want to tell everybody what's been going on with you anything interesting sure well first of all congratulations 100 episodes that uh that is a lot did you think you'd actually get to that point when you started uh I mean, it was either that or I was going to die at some point, so I guess so. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Good outlook. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, that's just the reality of it. Um, right. But th right. yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's been a while for sure. I mean, here's the thing, everybody out there who has cares about the uh, podcast lore. Chip and I actually have hung out many times well after he was done on the podcast. It's just that uh, if you want to know the truth, uh, Chip, I don't think I've ever actually told you this. You are probably the biggest reason the podcast is still around. Really? Um, be yes, because when I first started it, uh, I kind of just did it. You know, just because I felt like it was something I should do because I, I, I kind of made a Patreon against my will. That's a whole different story. But when I made it, 
Um, I wanted to give content back to Patreon backers specifically, and I wanted there to be something that was special to them, but I also didn't want to lock out the content completely from the, the normal uh, viewer base. So mm -hmm. that's why I decided, okay, the, this thing will come out early and then it'll, it'll, you know, for Patreon backers, it'll be very early. And then on the main channel, it'll come out later, just kind of towards the end. And um, I actually, you know, to tell you the complete truth, I hadn't planned it wasn't going that great. <laughs> like initially it was just going to be me like by myself for a while. And I, I didn't really dig that. So I was actually prepared to kind of, you know, quit on it. But then one day I got this notification on Patreon that this guy named chip, I'm not going to say your last name in case you want it private. Although mm -hmm. I think you've said it on here before. Probably. Um, yeah. I, I won't say it though, just in case um, chip goes ahead and says like, you know chip blank wants to be you know has subscribed to your patreon and i was looking i was like wow he this guy signed up to be on my podcast i can't believe that because that was always a tear uh and then we talked for a bit and you were like no this wasn't a, i think i actually messaged you and said like was this a mistake <laughs> did you mean to do you this? did and you were like you did yeah, message you were, me that i remember yeah and uh, you were like no 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 I, I i meant that so um we did that for you had said you were going to do it for a year uh we did it for 11 months yeah uh, the only reason the last month didn't happen is because he had then i'm not going to give all your life story away but he, he had lost his job and that was completely understandable and then yep. you know i know you you stepped away from video games and all that sort of stuff which is totally fine uh i still to this day consider chip very much a very good friend of mine so it's very nice to have him back here and for those listening this is the man who basically saved this podcast because if he hadn't done that <laughs> Um, I, this, this probably would have been a thing where I only did like four episodes of this and we would have never seen it again. So, yeah, well, yeah. You, that is so flattering for you to say. I mean, I remember cause I, I watched, obviously I knew who you were before you started the podcast. Cause I watched your videos. You were the guy that was just the hands. Cause I think back then you only <laughs> did videos with your hands for the longest time. When I actually got to yep. see you with your face, I was like, Oh, this is even more awesome than just his hands. Um, thank you. That was the thing. I don't know how many folks remember that you were the like, you were like the the video with the hands guy. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're, I still have them. You know, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you definitely were like uh, when I when I when when I saw this, I was like, oh, neat. You can actually uh, you can actually sign up to be on the podcast, and I was like, well, heck yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something like that. And uh, you were definitely like, are you sure? You know, it's just it's just me on this podcast. I'm like, well, yeah, that's that's why I want to do it. So, uh, if anything, I mean, having such a good host as yourself to really support folks, and it seems like a lot of different folks now, to uh, have fun and be part of the community a little bit more than they uh, than just being a, a video watcher is, is a pretty awesome thing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, if you don't mind, can you give me a little shout out there to Remy? I know he, he you guys oh, did, Remy, did the three for sure. Yeah. We did the three episodes together, uh, four episodes together, excuse me. Um, Remy, if you still listen to this, I have no idea if you do. I had no way to get a hold of you, and I'm very sorry. It would have been very nice for all three of us to get on here. Uh, hopefully you're out there, though. Yeah, Remy was great. I remember, uh, I can't remember, did we, I think we did maybe, maybe did one episode before Remy joined, or maybe, or maybe not. I'd, maybe you started. I'd. I don't remember. But, uh, I know uh, it, you and I did at least one, if not a okay. couple. I think we okay. did a few, and then he was around for like four, and then he had to go uh, yeah. of his accord. We 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 had no, you know, nothing to do with that. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was uh, that was nice. Well, it yeah, Remy was great. I remember you were like, yeah. "Hey, you know, this Remy uh, also signed up to join. Like, are you comfortable with that?" And I was like, "Yeah, I guess so." You know, not really knowing what to expect. And it was a blast. Remy made things. Uh, even more dynamic and added another 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 voice and a perspective which was fantastic but i'm sure you've had uh every person that's joined i'm sure has provided a different uh flavor different color to the podcast so it's always fun yeah. to have really fun interesting folks join and, and provide insight and stuff well, I appreciate that. But uh, all right, so we've kind of gone down memory lane for like seven <laughs> minutes on this. So I, let's get to the first. Yeah. I was just going to give you a shocker question. So we, you kind of cheated a little bit because I was going to ask you, we were going to do the whole like, let's talk about the podcast itself at the end, but we already did it. So I guess that's how that's going to oh, start. But, uh, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, so there's now going to be a little fluffer question for you. I have to ask okay. you a goof question. I did not tell Chip in advance what this question was going to be. Rolling up my so, sleeves here, getting ready, yeah. bracing myself. All right. Okay. There is a question he does know already, 
But this is the one he doesn't know. Uh, okay, Chip. Yeah. Would you rather have 25 Dreamcasts or 100 episodes of this podcast? 25 Dreamcasts or 100 episodes of the podcast? Hmm. I mean, I got to say, you can go out and you can buy a Dreamcast, but the podcast is something so unique, I'd pick 100 episodes of the podcast. Well, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Uh, the answer oh. is 25 Dreamcasts. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, oh, no. no I, mean, I, I mean, just a, here's the thing. Just objectively, you can get 25 drink. You can sell those. Like, 100 episodes of the podcast. They're already out there. You can already oh, I'm have. I'm going to see 100 more. 100 more episodes, <laughs> oh. dude. Oh, dude, I'll die. It's the thing is, it's a, it's, it's not like an episode a week or like an episode a day. This is an episode a month. So a hundred months have gone yeah. by. I'm telling you, that's why, uh, that's why they're so valuable. Uh huh. Sure, sounds about right. Well, th- all the same. <laughs> all right. Well. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Um. So it, okay. All right. Now we'll get on to the the question you did know and uh, the one we're going to kind of round out this episode with, and the partially why I brought that up. So. One of our Patreon backers is a a nice gentleman named Spencer Per Year, which this dude doesn't get enough credit, Chip. You might actually appreciate this. Spencer Per Year is actually at the tier in which he could he actually pays to be on this podcast hmm. every single month. Hmm. He has That's... never once actually been on it. Every really? month what? he's just like, yeah, exactly. He it, like he's at the level in which he could just you know he basically just picks a subject, but he pays to be on it. And when I told him, like, you know, uh, the first time I tried to schedule this with him, I was like, hey, so, like, what's your availability and everything? And he he was super cool about it. He's like, hey, dude, I actually don't want to be on it. I just want to pick a subject. The thing is, I didn't want to I didn't want you to miss out on the revenue because I know you need the money and I don't want you leaving YouTube. So that's how good of a dude Spencer per year is. And so I want you to know, Chip, because there's there's other good people like you, such Uh as Spencer. Spencer yeah. Perrier. That, that's an awesome last name, by the way, Perrier. I mean, yeah, man, is. that is a fantastic yeah. last name. Well, wow, that's awesome. That, he, that is so kind of him to do that. I agree. And, uh, I, I, I won't say your last name, Chip, but I also <laughs> think your, your last name is great, mm. uh, especially the way you first explained. Actually, you did. I remember you straight up explained how your last name worked in the first episode. So if you want to know Chip's actual last name, go to the first episode. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, in all seriousness. Okay. So the question that Spencer Perrier selected Um, So the Dreamcast is 25 now, actually Mm. effective yesterday at the time of this recording. So November or sorry, so November, September 9th, 2024 (laughs) was the um, uh, 25th birthday in North America. I did a video on it and all that stuff. I know it's old in this. It's a quarter of a century old. I said that in the video and somebody got like depressed at me. Not mad. (laughs) Depressed. (laughs) Um, So anyway, yeah, it's it's 25 years old. Hence, I asked you if you wanted 25 Dreamcasts or 100 episodes. Yeah. Uh, his specific question in that regard was, will there ever be another immortal zombie console just like the Dreamcast? And I wanted you to be the one to, that we would talk about this with, not only because I know you were you know, a big Dreamcast guy, and it kind of goes mm-hmm. back to our, our roots talking on this, but I also know at least for a time there, you actually were buying the indies and stuff like that. So oh, I yeah. figured you'd, you'd have yeah. some, some take on this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I guess for for context for folks that uh, maybe weren't in, weren't tuned in early on the podcast. So yeah, I had quite a few. Uh, in part, Adam, you actually inspired me to to get involved in and in getting Dreamcast. Some of the crazy gear. I remember watching your uh, it's like a, a divers uh, yep. Dreamcast. I, like some, I get some... I get blamed for a lot of people's collecting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's your fault, Adam. How dare exactly. you? Exactly. Thank uh, you. That's what I want to hear. All right, good. <laughs> But yeah, so I, I got in a little bit to, to collecting those, and uh, I remember uh, it was fascinating because it really was the console that would not die, the zombie console, because every year you'd have anywhere from one to like three brand new games released on disc, not even just a digital version that you would have to burn yourself. You could actually buy a press disc. Now, they weren't the GD-ROMs uh, anymore because you couldn't get the GD-ROMs themselves, but... Uh, for the most part, you know, just like a, a burned disc, but like a the nice factory burned version as opposed to like you put it in your computer and burn it. So there's a quality It's a press disc. It's pressed. Yeah, it's yeah, pressed. It's pressed. I couldn't remember the word. It's press disc. Um, and it was just so fascinating because this whole community of folks that you, you had like Kickstarters popping up to fund 
uh, new games that would have a Dreamcast release. Um, you had press covering these new releases as if they were like like your traditional brand new game. It was, and still is, to my knowledge, such a wild experience compared to other systems, which they themselves you could consider zombies because people still develop, right? You can find like old like Commodore 64 systems and stuff where people will still develop a game, but mostly it's emulation or it's, hey, cool, like, yeah, we made this thing and you can try to go like produce a cassette for the Commodore 64 yourself or something, but the Dreamcast really had it all and still has it all. And that's kind of one of the things that set it apart uh, as the, hey, this console is still around and it's still kicking as opposed to limping. So I guess all that to be said is, from that sense, it feels like the Dreamcast is uh, in a unique class of its own in terms of being that forever console versus other ones that have a presence. They have communities. They make games, but not in the same way the Dreamcast has had. Yeah, I think that's actually some very good context in order to be able to explain this because all of that is necessary to understand. Like Because there are other consoles that still get releases, like NES... I think you throw a rock, you'll hit a new NES release. Mm-hmm. Those happen mm-hmm. all the time, um, largely due to the age of the system and the fact that there's, you know, it, it had such a wider install base. Um, but you're right that there is every time there's a release, there's not as much energy around it because there's just so many of them. Mm-hmm. The Dreamcast new releases, at least in the Dreamcast community, certainly come off like an event because there is really only like three a year which by the way there there was uh this year so far there's been two within 2024 and there, there was, you go uh yeah there i and then technically since the last birthday there was three because there was one called driving strikers but it came out in t- 2023 like around the previous birthday um hmm. that one was really cool because not only do they you know make the game they also sort of innovate like driving strikers is um uh, it's like Rocket League for the Dreamcast. It even has online broadband support, so you can do matches and stuff. Like, people still do things with the Dreamcast, and I think it's you know it's key to understand that that may never be replicatable, as right. far as like the question basically says the Immortal Zombie console. Because I will argue the Dreamcast is the most powerful console ever made that is capable of reading unsigned code, and what I mean by that is. Yes, the original Xbox, the GameCube, uh, obviously anything after that, all the way up into now, the PS5 Pro, whatever. Um, none of them are able to read content unless hacked mm-hmm. or modified. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Dreamcast, with the exception of the very, very tail-end Revision 2 units, can all read unsigned code in some capacity, meaning somebody can make a game, as Chip described, press it without sega's authorization and trust me when i say not only do they not care they're actually pretty cool with it uh that can be done distributed sold etc and no one has a problem with it it'll run native you know you can somebody can hack let's just go back to the original xbox somebody can modify an original xbox everybody does it's super easy and then of course it'll run whatever you want it to but if nobody can make a new pressed disc release for it unless they're expected to understand that it will only work on a modified system there i believe it or not chip i don't know how much you pay attention to this there are releases like that now there's actually um a game called xeno crisis uh which is actually a game i'm in as a random npc by the way oh. came out for the gamecube it had a pressed release for the gamecube but it says right there on the packaging and of course when you buy it by the way this will only work on a modified gamecube uh because the gamecube can't read unsigned code mm. So it will basically, and that, you know, I, I just don't think you're ever going to find somebody else, another company that's okay with that. You know, like Sega is very aware of all of this. Yep. They have never once tried to stop anybody. In fact, I, I can't tell all the details, but there are stories, and I will assure you these did occur, where Sega got somewhat involved in some of these and said, like, you can make money. We don't care. Just don't do this. Just please don't Mm. do that and Mm -hmm. then we don't have to have a problem if we don't have a problem you guys are welcome to sell whatever you want on our system we don't expect any money you know that kind of thing yeah Yeah. so you have a combination of powerful enough hardware uh easy enough to develop for hardware uh it can read unsigned code which means people can mass produce games directly for it 
mm-hmm. uh, without the original equipment. And its parent company is not only you know okay with it, they actually kind of encourage it, mm-hmm. uh, even though it, it doesn't make anything for them. I mean, meanwhile, Nintendo, if you tweet about them, they'll send you a cease and desist. You know what I mean? Like, so it's just, right, it's not, right. it's, it's not, it's Whole not the different same world. attitude. Yeah. So I, I would say I don't think, unless, unless, like, literally it would have to be this stupid. Like, I know, Chip, you probably didn't even notice this morning the PS5 Pro uh, debacle. Um, hmm. Uh, it's going to retail for seven hundred dollars US before tax, <laughs> and oh my gosh. <laughs> and it doesn't it doesn't include a disc drive. So if you want a disc drive, you have to pay another eighty dollars for a detachable one. Um, oh, what, do the, wait, hold on. Do the discs even do anything? Because wasn't it the case just, that basically they're always just digital download copies on a disc? Um, they're they're PS five discs. So like, he, I'm not. We don't need to go into all that. But basically, the disc drive it's not totally worthless. Like if you want a disc still and i'm very much a proponent of physical media that's your technical option on it but the point is it's nearly eight hundred dollars actually would be over eight hundred dollars with taxes to to get this thing and it's not even the next generation system it's just the mid-generation upgrade Uh. um but unless sony did something monumentally stupid like made it so that the ps5 pro could just read you know like burned 4k ultra discs and Mm -hmm had no way to block it you know like which of course they could patch these days right unless something somebody did something that level of stupid you're never going to get a more powerful physical media based console that's going to do that because the 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 other thing that the ps4 or ps5 pro indicates is that this is kind of the end for physical media for the most part right and uh that means we already know of every single video game console that ever used physical media, with the exception of any sort of mild iterations we have here towards the end of it. And that puts, like Chip said very well, that puts the Dreamcast kind of into a class of its own. So, I, alas, I do not think there will ever be another immortal zombie console like it. I think some of the older hardware will continue to get love. You know, there are new Genesis and uh, NES releases, as we mentioned, but it's they're so frequent and usually just not well i don't know advertised i i think it's just a little different i'm not gonna say the dreamcast like has like million dollar budgets for each of these games or anything but it it is always kind of at least within that community it's very known what's happening on the dreamcast community and it just has this unique energy that doesn't exist on the other systems at least in my experience covering it well said. Thank you. Well, then that is pretty much it. I was going to say, if this is where I was going to say, if you had any other final thoughts on this or the podcast in general, now would be the time, Chip. Or if there's anything else you want to say to the folks uh, now that you're back, at least temporarily. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think the main thing is just uh, a little thanks, right? Thanks, folks, for continuing to tune into the podcast and supporting Adam. Uh, I know you appreciate it quite a lot. and I do. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I, I love seeing communities like these continue to, to run and, and people get together and it seems like this is a good one. Um, plus, Hey, we all care about the dreamcast and, uh, it's a fun one, right? You got so many fun peripherals and everything. So why not, why not help Adam out and be involved in the community and the dreamcast community at large? It's a fun, fun place to be. I agree. So thank you very much to Spencer specifically for picking that subject. I want to thank Abdullah for his cameo time before Rob, of course, uh, as well as Joseph, of course, Sinjeet for your subject. Shout outs again to Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega, Steve, Tim, Emman, Trey Wagner, as well as everybody else who uh, listens to this is any sort of Patreon backer or just listens to it on YouTube. Just uh, appreciate when you give it a like a comment or a subscribe, especially, you know, just good to get some traction on it. Always appreciate that so to everyone who has ever sat down and listened to even a few seconds of any one of these 100 episodes thank you so much to all of you and chip also a huge special shout out to you not only because you are literally on the call right now with me but also (laughs) because this would never have endured without you and he had no idea i was going to basically gush on him about that so (laughs) i'm turning (laughs) red over here you got me turning red yeah yeah anyway as always Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Do me a favor. Please like the video, comment down below, subscribe if you've never done that before. Check out all the social media and stuff in the description. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Patreon, obviously. Spreadshirt, as well as my travel channel. Actually, the travel channel, you might see Chip coming up soon. Just, you know, stay tuned. 
dun, 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 it might happen. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all later.